If someone has done something nice for you, don't you feel like you want to do something nice back? Why do we feel the need to reciprocate like this? The first of the six principles of influence that Cialdini identified is the principle of reciprocation. Reciprocation is one of the most important things in our social lives. If there's someone who does something nice for you, we really want to do something nice back. So the reciprocation rule is that we should be more willing to comply with a request from someone who has previously provided a favour or concession to us. I don't know if you've ever had the situation where someone's done something nice for you and you can't repay it. Maybe a stranger has done something nice for you and there's no possibility of repaying it. It's actually quite anxiety provoking. We really want to be able to repay nice things. So what is it that makes us feel anxious about not being able to return the favour? Well, there's a powerful norm for reciprocation in society. We feel an obligation to return the form of the behaviour we receive from another. We like those who like us, we cooperate with people who cooperate with us, and we compete with people who compete with us. We self-disclose to those who self-disclose to us. We also make concessions to those who make concessions to us. We feel obligated to provide gifts, favours, services and aid to those who have given such things to us first. We even give larger favours than those received, as we'll soon see. This norm allowed society to develop and forms a basis of trade and other relationships. Without this norm, people wouldn't be able to trust that the other person would go through with their side of the deal. So let's look at an example of how reciprocation can work. In a study by Regan in 1971, two people turned up to take part, but had to wait in a secretary's office at the start. Only one of the participants was a real participant. The other person was an actor or confederate. The secretary left the office to do something and after a couple of minutes, the phone on the desk rang. In the pleasant condition, the confederate said to the caller on the phone, I'm sorry, but I don't work in the building and I don't know where the secretary is. If you try again a bit later, perhaps the secretary might have returned. In the unpleasant condition, on the other hand, the confederate said, Nah, there's no secretary here. Look, I don't work here, lady, for Christ's sake. Just call later. He hung up without saying goodbye, clearly in the middle of the caller's conversation. Of course, this was all a setup, and it was just someone from the research team who called. Here, Regan had manipulated the likability or the pleasantness of the Confederate. In the pleasant condition, the Confederate was polite on the phone. In the unpleasant condition, the Confederate wasn't so polite. He was a bit of a jerk, actually. Next, the experimenter arrived and pretended not to know what had gone on. The experimenter took the two participants to the lab to do the study they'd signed up for, which was writing about how much they liked various paintings. Halfway through this experiment, the confederate leaves the room to get a drink. A third of the time when they come back, they brought back a drink for the participant and said, here I brought a drink, because while I was at the vending machine I thought it was just as easy to buy you a drink while I was getting one for myself. This was the favour condition. Another third of the time, the confederate didn't bring back a drink for the participant. This was the no favour condition. The final group of participants were given a drink by the experimenter, not the confederate. This was a control condition to make sure that any favour effect was not just because participants had a tasty drink. Just like in the no drink condition, there should be no pressure for reciprocating any favour if asked by the confederate later on. Towards the end of the experiment, the confederate writes out a note and gives it to the real participant. The note says, would you do me a favour? I'm selling raffle tickets for my high school back home to build a new gym. The tickets cost 25 cents each and the prize is a new Corvette. The thing is, if I sell the most tickets, I get 50 bucks and I could use it. If you'd buy any, would you just write the number on this note and give it back to me right away so I can make out the tickets? Any would help, the more the better. Thanks. The researchers then recorded how many raffle tickets the real participant bought from the Confederate. Who do you think bought the most raffle tickets? The people who were given the soft drink or the other people who missed out on a soft drink? Do you think the experimenter giving them a soft drink would have any effect? What about how much we like the person asking us? And most importantly, why do you think they did it? <laughs>